here and what you are about to hear is the fusion of heart mind and soul and welcome all my listeners all my supporters from all around the spherical globe and all across the fruited plain hey i am streaming live on my facebook open up the doors page if you'd like to join in uh, over there and join in the conversation over on facebook live hop on over to uh, facebook.com slash faith fm 91.7 that's uh, facebook.com slash faith fm 91.7 and join in the conversation and let it let me know where you're watching from where you're listening from uh, if you are outside of the faith fm broadcast area the best way to listen to uh all of christian broad uh you know programming here on faith fm is to go on over to hamptons on on your in your browser and just uh you know scroll down the menu to the faith fm link and we are streaming over the internet uh, over there on hamptonschristian.com we also have the app best way to listen is really with the app the faith fm app which we have out for the android and you can get that link also there at the faith fm web page uh hamptonschristian.com also if you're on um if you're on uh, facebook live here i believe uh debbie put the uh the, the link up for the app the app is we got it for the Android. We're still waiting. We are still waiting for the app, for the Apple. I don't really know what's taking it so long, but that's Apple for you, I guess. Anyway, if you'd like to email me, you could email me at ajwhite777 at iCloud.com. That's ajwhite777 at iCloud.com. And what else do I want to cover before I jump in the water here with all that I've got to share this week? You know, there's... Uh, I, I you know, well, I think I'll just, I'll just get right to it. I, I, there was something else I wanted to mention. Now I can't think of what it was. It'll come to me at some point in time. But I want to I want to discuss a little bit about the big news of the week. Well, for me, what I think the big news of the week is, and actually, there's a lot of things going on. There's always a lot of things going on, of course. But I can't get everything that's going on in the world into an, an hour broadcast. But I do want to focus on the the fire that happened at Notre Dame in Paris this past Monday and share share my thoughts and, and some of the things that are coming to light with uh, this incident. But, you know, when I first saw it Monday, my very first thoughts that I had when I was seeing the news and seeing the pictures of that burning cathedral, I had, you know, needless to say, it was very, it was, it was certainly very sad to be watching that and seeing the pictures. But my very first thought I had to tell you, my friends, was that I, I, as soon as I saw it, I said, man, this is prophetic. This there's something very prophetic going on here. I believe it's a prophetic sign, and I'm going to get into that in a, in, a, in a minute of why I'm saying that. But you know, France, and I've been sharing these things for quite some time on this broadcast over the last couple of years. But France, along with most of Europe, has long ago, really long ago, abandoned real biblical Christianity. Europe is being overrun by Islam, and particularly in France, and this fire. At Notre Dame, Dom. I got to. I got to practice saying Notre Dame. I, I'm going to be a little. I'll be a little bit uh, transparent here. Until this past week, I've always pronounced it Notre Dame, 
Everybody I know around me on Long Island pronounces it Notre Dame. And all week long I'm hearing Notre Dame, Notre Dame. And I'm scratching my head going, man, why do they got to keep changing the way things sound all the time? I mean, for years. Another thing while I'm thinking about that, for years it was, you know, it was... It was Jaguar. My, you know, if, if you wanted to buy a nice luxury car, you'd buy a Jaguar, you know? And then a couple of years ago on TV, I heard, I heard the commercials, get the new Jaguar. Me and my wife looking at each other going, Jaguar? What the heck's a Jaguar? You mean the Jaguar? Anyway, I digressed already quickly. <laughs> but the fire at Notre Dame has brought a lot of things to the forefront. Now, I have to get serious right now after that little giddiness I had there, but it's brutal. It's really brought a lot of things to the forefront that the mainstream media, and for that matter, much of any media has been talking about. There are, to be sure, there are a few outlets, a precious few, that have been sounding the alarm and raising the warnings for some time now. Organizations uh, like the Gatestone Institute, for instance, Jihad Watch, uh, sends out reports all the time. They've been warning. They've been sounding alarms, but they're they're precious few, and they're good. They're good resources, and they're they're commendable. But they're not the mainstream media, and they're not widely known and read. However, there are things that have been going on in France and across Europe that have been swept under the rug in large measure for quite some time. And and, and the media doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, that they don't want to cover it. Uh, Even the Catholic Church, I found out this past week from doing a lot of research and reading on what's been going on over there, even the Catholic Church has been strangely silent about some things because they don't want to talk about what's going on because of the implications, which I'll get to in a moment. But there's no denying, my friends, that there is an uptick and and a growing persecution against Christians and anything that even symbolizes Christianity going on all across Europe. And that's why I said I I do believe this incident has prophetic and symbolic significance. It's the symbolism that's so important, and and really it's 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 really a, a it's really about the symbolism. When I posted my thoughts on Monday about what I was seeing, someone commented in my comment stream and they asked the question, and I'm just going to quote what they said. I'm not going to opine on the correctness of what they said. I'm just going to quote what they said. So I don't want no, nobody calling me up, telling me I'm, I'm, I'm bashing the Catholic Church. I'm just quoting someone that made a comment. After I said that this, this, that the burning of Notre Dame was, was definitely prophetic and definitely symbolic, this person commented, quote, the Catholic Church is a pagan religion. It perverted Christianity. How is this a sign for Christianity? And my answer really was very simple, because it's pretty obvious, I thought. Because to the Islamic world and to the secular world, cathedrals as such, like like Notre Dame, any cathedral, the Vatican, St. Peter's Basilica, whatever you might think about the Catholic Church as a Bible-believing Christian, as a Protestant, it's, it's immaterial. It's a symbol of Christianity, regardless of what we think about it as Bible-believing Christians. And Notre Dame and any and all big cathedrals, cathedrals, excuse me, to the Islamic world, that represents the West. They're symbols of the West. They're symbols of Christianity in particular, which is precisely why the Islamists and the jihadists like ISIS were all celebrating, as even as Jihad Watch reported, as I mentioned Jihad Watch a moment ago, as, as the pictures were, were coming out, as the videos were, were coming out, as people around the world were, were really in shock and, and awe, and, 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 uh, and Catholics in particular probably mournful about this, this. I mean, Notre Dame, say what you will about the Catholic Church. It's an incredible building. It took centuries to build this, this cathedral. But the jihadists, the, 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 the ISIS people, uh, uh, they were they were celebrating this thing burning down because again it was the symbol of what was of what was in front of everybody's face, and as was reported in Jihad Watch, jihadists may not have set the fire, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. But jihadists might not have set the fire. They write here in Jihad Watch, but they're certainly celebrating it. Many Muslims believe 
that the ruins and destruction of non-Muslim structures testifies to the truth of Islam, as the Quran suggests that the destroyed remnants of, of non-Muslim civilizations are a sign of Allah's punishment to those who rejected his truth. In another magazine, a newspaper called the American Mirror, there was a headline, Allah es grand. I guess that's French for Allahu Akbar. But it was Allah es grand. Muslims were laughing as the blaze destroys Notre Dame Cathedral during Holy Week was the was the headline and again i'll say it because regardless of what we think it's a symbol but regardless of what the islamic world thinks let me let me advance the ball downfield a little bit regardless of what the islamic world thinks you can't escape the fact that there was something deep and very profound watching that cathedral burn, watching that symbol of, of Christian Europe burn. In another really good piece written in the blog site, and I have this up on the Open Up the Doors uh, Facebook page, it's a really good piece that was put out by uh, the blog site uh, Israel, Islam, and the End Times. And the title of the piece was Notre Dame and the Fate of the West. And the, the author, Bill Muhlenberg, wrote, While the smoke still rises, many are asking if this is not a fitting picture of France in particular and Europe and the West in general. And that was exactly what hit me when I first saw the pictures. When I read this article, I was like, man, it wasn't just me. <laughs> Everyone's asking the same question. Many are asking if this is not a fitting picture of Europe and the West in general. The article goes on to say, I pulled this quote out of it, with the cause of the blaze that took down much of Notre Dame still uncertain, was it an accident or arson or terrorism? And I'm gonna, like I said, I'm going to get into that in a minute. But many commentators have already noted the deep symbolism of the event. Yes, you just can't get away from that. If you, if, There's a backstory to this that I'm going to get to because this didn't happen in the vacuum, my friends. And this article, again, let me get back to it. So I, I don't want to keep digressing here. But many commentators have already noted the deep symbolism of the event. That is, with irreligion reigning supreme and Europe being the most secular continent on Earth, is not this tragedy a very graphic picture of what has been happening for, for quite some time now? Sure, around half of the French population still claims to be Christian in various forms, but that would largely be nominal at best. Even uh, the Jewish columnist Dennis Prager had this to say, Quote, uh, he wrote this in the, uh, I believe it was in townhall.com from Dennis Prager. Quote, the, symbol, the symbolism, the symbolism of the burning of Notre Dame Cathedral, the most renowned building in Western civilization, the iconic symbol of Western Christendom is hard to miss. I mean, even a secular Jew can get it. Something prophetic was happening there. I'm convinced of it. Dennis Prager goes on to say this. It is as if God himself wanted to warn us in the most unmistakable way that Western Christianity is burning and with it, Western civilization. That's exactly why the jihadists and ISIS were cheering and celebrating that's exactly what it, it, the the, uh, the ISIS website. I still can't believe these guys have a website, <laughs> but or uh, they're able. To, well, I don't know if it's probably not. They don't claim you know the ISIS website, but they get on the internet. But ISIS put out a picture, a poster of the cathedral in flames, blazing flames appeared online with a taunt: "Have a good day." The ISIS group, al Montesia group, if I'm pronouncing that right, al Montesia, 
according to the Terrorism Research and Analysis Consortium. The jihadists in this uh, uh, online piece that they put out there with Have a Good Day, the jihadists referred to the catastrophe as retribution and punishment from Allah. Now, I got to tell you something, folks. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. And though I don't attribute it to Allah, because I, well, I won't go down that road right now. It certainly is interesting. I'll just say it like this. These prophetic things that happen, whether God directly caused it or not, God uses them to wake us up. But getting to the actual cause seems to remain quite a mystery, honestly. I'm, I'm, wondering, I really, I'm wondering if the truth of how this fire started will ever be made known. I'm wondering if the truth of the cause will, will actually ever come to light. French prosecutors on Tuesday, before any investigations were done, And I still think they're lacking in the investigative. I've hardly seen any reports about an intense investigation going on. It's very odd, my friends. But French prosecutors on Tuesday said the fire was probably caused by accident. And yes, that's a good word. Uh, Someone on Facebook just made a comment. That's a perfect word, Debbie, a harbinger. Yes, thank you for that word. This burning of this cathedral certainly is a harbinger. Of things to come no doubt about it thank you for that comment but the French are immediately saying oh it was probably operative word caused by accident maybe maybe but personally I doubt it now I have no I have no inside information I have nothing but a gut feeling But again, this hasn't happened in the vacuum. I find it awfully strange that there's hardly been any reporting that I've seen that's talking about the cause of this fire other than probabilities and maybes. But I haven't seen any reporting of any intense investigation into the cause. And that seems really odd to me. Almost like they know. But they're afraid to publicly say it. There was a report. Someone tweeted when the fire was raging. Someone tweeted tweeted out, and the, and the tweet was taken down off of Twitter, but someone had tweeted that a friend of his was a worker there, and the workers were saying that it was purposefully set. But as soon as that tweet went out, it was down within minutes. Again, I don't, I don't peddle in conspiracy theories. I'm just reporting to you right now what was reported. It seems very strange. It seems very, very strange to me. I don't think they publicly want, if they know what happened, I don't think they publicly want it to get out because of the unrest that it might create. But I do find it strange that they're not publicly inquiring into the questions of who is behind this fire. And I could be wrong. I mean, I could totally be wrong. It could totally possibly be accidental. But the reason for so much uh, gut feelings from people and the reason that there's so much... uh, uh, questions about it because I'll say it again this did not happen in a vacuum and this is what's coming to the forefront now because of this fire things that weren't being reported wide, uh, widely that, that a few outlets like Breitbart reported a month ago but in 2018 last year the Ministry of the Interior in France recorded 541 anti-Semitic acts 100 anti-Muslim acts. Isn't that amazing? All we ever hear about uh, on the news these days is, is seem, seemingly is Islamophobia and seemingly how, how Muslims are feeling like, you know, they're being, they're being wronged and they're being, uh, uh, you know, attacked. They're being ridiculed. But that's not what the facts say at all. It's a scam. It's a sham. But the Ministry of Interior, I'll say it again, recorded 541 anti-Semitic acts, 100 anti-Muslim acts, and you're ready for this, folks? Button up. Button, buckle it down. Buckle up. 
France. 100 anti-Muslim acts. Let that sink in. 1,063. Whoops. I just slammed my mouse over here. I just sent the mouse. I, I'm Italian. I speak with my hands. And I got my hands flying around here. And the, I just knocked the computer mouse like halfway across the room. <laughs> Where was I? 163 anti-Christian acts in France in 2018. 875 Catholic churches in 2018 were vandalized and or burned in France in 2018. Breitbart reported last month on March 20th that in one week time, a dozen churches were vandalized and or burned in France. And Breitbart reported this a month ago, but nobody seemed to notice. I didn't see this report until this week because all of a sudden people are like, wait a minute, this this burning of Notre Dame, this this has been going on. That's why people are skeptical with the question of, well, maybe it was just an accident. Breitbart reported, let me quote from Breitbart from March, March 20th, a dozen Catholic churches have been desecrated across France over the period of one week in an egregious cause of anti-Christian vandalism. The recent spate of church profanations, that's such a crazy word, prof- profanations, I would have just used the word desecration. It's easier to say. But anyway, I'll get back to the article. The recent spate of church deformations, I'm going to say, has puzzled both police and ecclesiastical leaders who have, who have mostly remained silent. That, like, jumped out at me when I'm reading this article. Why have they remained silent? A dozen churches were burned in the period of a week, and leaders are remaining silent? as the violations have spread up and down France. This is only last month, my friends. Last, uh, on March 17th, uh, marauders set fire to the church of St. Sulpice, or Sulpice, one of Fran- Paris's largest and most important churches, right after the 12 o'clock Mass. One month ago, one of the largest churches in, in, in Paris was set on fire. Now, do you want to know why we have this gut feeling that something uh, is fishy with this Notre Dame fire? In Nimes, if that's how you pronounce this French city, in Nimes, near the border with Spain, the church of Notre Dame des Advents was desecrated in a particularly odious way, with vandals painting a cross with human excrement, looting the main altar and the tabernacle and stealing the consecrated hosts, which were discovered later among piles of garbage. Likewise, the church of Notre Dame in Dijon, in the east of the country, suffered the sacking of the high altar, and the hosts were also taken from the tabernacle, scattered on the ground, and trampled underfoot. This all happened just last month, all across France and other churches that are called Notre Dame. And they are dismissing this newest incident as merely an accident. There's a longer list that I can go through, but for the sake of time, I can't and I won't. But here's the thing. The Catholic hierarchy has kept silent about the episodes, limiting themselves to highlighting that anti-Christian threat and expressing hope that the politicians and police will get to the bottom of the crimes. Just just take care of it. But, but reports indicate that 80% of the desecration of places of worship in France concerns Christian churches. 80%. Not mosques and not even synagogues. 80% of the desecration are of Christian churches. And in the year 2018, this meant the desecrating of an average of two churches per day in France, even though these incidents never made the headlines. The simple fact is, my friends, is that anti-Christian bigotry and persecution is clearly on the rise all across France and Europe. And I've been talking about this for some time now. And it's evident where it's coming from for those who are not willfully blinding themselves. And that's why they, want, they don't want to talk about it. But I'm going to take a break right now. But I want to tell you this. Um, Jesus said, I will build my church, brothers and sisters, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Persecution is on the rise. And, and, and things, there's going to, well, I won't get, I'll get into that in the next block. 
But the church has always grown, my friends, in the midst of calamity and catastrophe. But stick around, I'll be right back. Here's Daryl Evans, alive. Daryl Evans, alive. The resurrection and the life, living on the inside. Hallelujah. Even as we are coming in to, uh, of course, Easter weekend. Today is actually Holy Thursday. And I actually did, believe it or not, I actually really did have a different broadcast for, for today, but I changed it up with the events of this past week. By the way, before I wander off into my own land of thoughts, if you're just joining us right now, you are listening to Open Up the Doors here on Faith FM at WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in Napeague, WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. But I've been talking about this, the, the fire at Notre Dame and what's been going on in France and really all across Europe and why, why the symbolism was so poignant, really. Because Europe decided to secularize itself really many years ago. And again, I've talked about these things before. But it, 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 Europe's been selling its big churches and cathedrals to Muslims so they can become mosques. We know that, that Christianity and church attendance in France is almost non-existent. In fact, it's really all, in Europe period, it's almost non-existent, non-existent I should say. Many of the leaders in, in, in Europe are socialists. They're globalists. And they have invited, encouraged the mass invasion of immigrants into their borders. And now, quite frankly, they are reaping the consequences of their naive policies. I, I said at the top of the program that one of the organizations that have constantly and consistently been reporting on the rise of Islam in Europe and, uh, and, 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 and reporting on you know, the anti-Semitism or the, or the, or the uh, anti-Christian, the Christian persecution that's been rising. One of those organizations is Gatestone Institute. It's, it's a great resource. You should go over and like their page if you've never liked their page. I get a lot of my, I get a lot of my uh, research from Gatestone because they've got a, they've got a really good, really good, um, just a really good resource. But anyway, curiously enough, like my wife always tells me, she always tells me, you're always ahead of the curve. Sometimes I don't want to be ahead of certain curves. But Monday morning, before I came into work, I posted an article from Gatestone Institute. And the name of the article was Europe Churches Being Vandalized. That was Monday morning, before the fire at Notre Dame broke out. Notre Dame, Notre Dame. <laughs> Got to change my, my uh, dialect here. But before the, the fire broke out, at Notre Dame on Monday, I had posted on the Open Up the Doors Facebook page this article from the Gatestone Institute, which I will now reference. But the, the, the four main points that Gatestone was reporting on Monday morning was one of the things they said in Germany, four, in Germany now, not France, four separate churches were vandalized and or torched in March alone. In this country, this is a quote a German newspaper said, in this country, there is a creeping war. Let this sink in. Sink in. There is a creeping war against everything that symbolizes Christianity. Attacks on mountain summit crosses, on sacred statues by the wayside, on churches, and recently also on cemeteries. In virtually every instance of church attacks, authorities and media have obfuscated the identity of the vandals. They don't want to lay the blame where the blame belongs. And even in those rare cases when it leaks out that it was a Muslim or a migrant, quote-unquote, migrant is a euphemism for, for the Muslims that have invaded Europe, the identity of destroyers is leaked in, in rare cases, but then they're, they're presented as just suffering from mental health issues. Again, it's, 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 it, there's this fear of, of calling terrorism what it is, like we, were, like we were going through here in the Obama years when Obama was president, and they wouldn't call a terrorist act a terrorist act, when they wouldn't call a jihadist a jihadist, when they, wouldn't, when they would try to separate the issues. But the Gatestone Institute wrote on Monday morning, hardly anyone writes and speaks about the increasing attacks on Christian symbols all across Europe. There is an eloquent silence there's an interesting phrase, an eloquent silence. There is an eloquent silence in both France and Germany about the scandal 
of desecrations and the origin of the perpetrators. Not a word, not even the slightest hint that could in any way lead to suspicion of migrants. It is not the perpetrators who are in danger of being ostracized, but those who dare to associate the desecration of Christian symbols with immigrant imports. They are accused of hatred, hate speech, and racism. Which leads me to think of an aside here. Just last week, the OIC, the Organization of Islamic uh, Countries, met at the UN, and they're trying to push through the UN to make Islamophobia a crime all across the world. In other words, it's, 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 it goes into what was just stated here. It's not the perpetrators who are in danger of being ostracized, but those of us who are calling it out. Oh, you can't call it out because that's Islamophobia. No, my friends, it's obfuscation. Because there's an agenda at hand, and they want to bring they want to bring the world under the dominion of Islam into dimitude. I've talked about these many, many times. But there is at least one brave soul. This guy just this past week. I don't know if you heard about this. Probably not. But this uh, high-ranking bishop in the Catholic Church has made it his mission to open Europe's eyes to the dangers posed by Muslim immigrants. And I want to tell you, this guy's a rarity because most of the, of the Catholic cardinals and bishops in Europe are embracing Islam, even suggesting that they give over the churches. I, read, I, I went through this a while back. You know what you guys need to do? Go, over, go on over to my YouTube channel. And uh, I did, I did a, a broadcast uh, a while back called Jihad on the Saints, where I covered a lot of this. But this particular guy this past week, Cardinal Robert Sarah, has been sounding this warning to Europe and the rest of the international community. He said this, if Islam succeeds in dominating Europe, it will go on to conquer the world. This guy is going to get ostracized from the Catholic Church because this is 180 degrees opposite of what the Pope's been saying. But this is the truth. This guy, uh, Robert, Cardinal Robert Sarah, he's got some chutzpah. He said this, as a bishop, it is my duty to warn the West. Oh, and by the way, by the way, this cardinal is a black guy. So let's not anybody play the race card here, because that's what they do. You know, when you start pointing out uh, what the Muslims and the migrants are doing, they call you a racist. But this guy's a black guy, so he can't play the race card. But Cardinal Sarah has compared the modern influx of Muslim migrants to the the invasions of barbarian tribes that ultimately brought down the Roman Empire in AD 475. If he said this, if Europe's policies toward Muslim migrants don't change, Sarah warned, Europe will be invaded by foreigners just as Rome has been invaded by barbarians. If Europe disappears and with it the priceless values of the old continent, which is what Notre Dame represented, Islam will invade the world and we will completely change culture, culture, anthropology, and moral vision. Now, folks, again, I've talked about this, this stuff on this broadcast for years now. I've talked about how, how, the, how there's a multifaceted uh, jihad. There's not, just, there's not just military jihad, but there's al-Hijra, the jihad of, of, of migration. Europe has been, been taken over little by little by Hijra to emigrate for the cause of Allah. And when you, when you combine al-Hijra al with al-Wilada, al-Wilada is procreation. If you can't beat them with bullets, beat them with babies. Jihad al-Wilada. Childbearing. It's seen as a way to contribute to the struggle, to the jihad, to make Islam supreme. And when you bring in the dynamic of the fact that the Muslim birth rate is far, far, far outpacing the European birth rates, the full Islamization of Europe is only a matter of time, my friends. And like I said, go back and listen to my broadcast, Jihad on the Saints. But this Cardinal Sarah, he's a lone voice. He is a voice of, of the voice of one crying in the wilderness of Europe, so to speak. I'm looking at the clock here. Let me see. You know what? I'm going to have to take a break right now. I got more stuff here. I'm going to save this last part for, 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 for the next block. I think I'll do that so I can catch up on, on what I need to do here. But it's a, let me say this before I go to the break. 
I'm going to say it again, what I said in the beginning of the broadcast. Sometimes we, we share these things and we can get all kind of down and out. Last week I, I, I did a broadcast called Winners and Losers. And in that broadcast I said, you know, sometimes it looks like you're losing, but we're not going to lose, my friends. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Though we're going to go in for some tough times, hey, we win in the end because God's not dead. Stick around. I'll be right back. Here's the news, boys, with God's Not Dead. God's Not Dead. Stick around, folks. I'll be right back. in that peak, WEGQ 91.7 in quad. And good afternoon, everybody. If you're just joining in here, I, I, I thank you. We're, we're about two-thirds of the way through this week's edition of Open Up the Doors, but I am, uh, fa- I am streaming live on my Open Up the Doors Facebook page. If you'd like to join in the conversation over there at facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. If you never like my page, please like the page and join the Open Up the Doors family. And uh, let us let us know where you're where you're watching from. Join in the conversation over there on Facebook Live as well. And um, I got a few minutes left here to get through the things I want to get through. But I said a moment ago, let me let me move let me let me move on with what I'm doing before I run out of time here. The church, my friends, has always grown in the midst of calamity and catastrophe. And during the ISIS attacks, as we all know, Christians were killed, uh, nominal Muslims were killed, because Islam, uh, fundamental, true, Quranic Islam, a lot of people say, well, you know, ISIS, they were corrupting Islam, they were hijacking Islam. No, that is what Islam looks like. They were practicing what the Quran and the Hadith actually teach them. But Christians were killed and brutalized. They were enslaved. They were forced from their homes. The, Yaz- the Yazidis people as well. Houses and churches were burned to the ground. But it's always been through the fires of persecution. And as it has been said, through the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. One of the organizations that has, um, that, that, that always, that's, that's what their ministry does. It's called Open Doors. It's not connected to Open Up the Doors here. But it's a ministry called Open Doors that they've been documenting the ever-increasing persecution of the church all around the world, as well as the perseverance of the saints. It's a really good organization, Open Doors. But I came across this story the other day, and it really just so much touched my heart. And I want to share it in the, in, in the few minutes I have left here. But Open Doors reported the other morning about this family, this Christian family that ISIS had run them out of their homes. And I'll just, I'll just read it out of, out of their report. Early one morning, Yumana's family was awakened by a loud explosion ripping through their town in Karakash, Iraq. Though many other families had already left Karakash, Yumana and her mother, Janak, had chosen to remain in their home. But the violence had come. Their town was under attack, and ISIS would soon be on their doorstep. Yumana and, y- and Yandak, her mother, quickly packed their belongings and held on to the hope that they would still have a home to come back to. Yumana said this, quote, I prepared my bag, but I didn't expect to be gone longer than a week, Yanok explains. Oh, that was the mom who said that. When I left, I left the door unlocked so ISIS wouldn't break in. I had a cross and I prayed, Jesus, why is this happening to us? Sometimes we ask those questions, don't we? We always say, Jesus, why is this happening to us? But many Christians like Yumana and Yanak who fled their towns wondered, is there anything worth coming back to? And after many long months, Yumana and Yandak, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, but they returned to their home in Karakash. And Jandak's cross, which he had left behind, had been broken into four pieces. Another Christian symbol just destroyed. The rest of the house had been ransacked and destroyed. 
and quoting her, she said, they took all the furniture and stripped everything out of the kitchen. They took all the clothes and burned them. And Isis's cruelty was hard for Janak to understand as she walked through her ruined home. But she said this. This is the bottom line. She said that her faith had taught her to love her enemies. It's in perseverance through persecution that the church of Jesus Christ will be triumphant, my friends. Because the gates of hell will not prevail against the church that Jesus is building. Yeah, there's an apostate church out there that's embracing doctrines of demons, but that's not the true church of Jesus Christ. John spoke of them this way. John said of them, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Jesus speaking to the church in Smyrna. And by the way, in in the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches, this church named Smyrna gets its name from the word myrrh, a fragrant aroma. Do you know that the suffering of the saints is a fragrant aroma to our God? That we diffuse the fragrant aroma of Jesus Christ. To the one, we're an aroma, a sweet-smelling aroma to God. To the other, we're the aroma of death to those who don't believe. But to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, write, excuse me, these things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works tribulation and poverty but you are rich do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer indeed the devil is about to throw some of you into prison what do you mean the devil is going to throw us into prison we're supposed to be victorious and we're supposed to be conquerors yet sometimes it looks like we're losing but we're winning Because Jesus said the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And I will, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. What the enemy, what the enemy means for harm, God means for good brothers and sisters what the enemy means for cursing god turns into a blessing what satan means for destruction god will use for our resurrection i shared it last week i love that verse over over in colossians where it says that through it the cross jesus uh triumphed over them he he made a public spectacle of the powers and principalities through the cross triumphing over them in it i shared that last week in the broadcast winners and losers it looked like jesus was losing but no he was winning he was doing the father's will he was the holy sacrifice upon the altar of propitiation jesus it looked like to the disciples he was losing it looked like the demons were were applauding just like isis was applauding when they were watching watching the, that, that, the, the Notre Dame burning. The demons, they cheer because they don't get it. They don't get, the, they don't get the paradox of the word of God that he who seeks to save his life shall lose it. He who loses his life for my sake shall win it, gain it. But I want to share another story in the few minutes I have here. Another story I came across. The, the title of the article was Christianity Grows. <laughs> Christianity grows in Syrian town once besieged by Islamic State because the seed of the church has always been the blood of the martyrs. It's the historical paradigm. Sadly, I think most of us in America don't get it. We've been so insulated and isolated from the reality of what's going on around the, around the world that we really, we have a hard time with this in the American church. And that's why I share so often the things that I do share, to try and help prepare us, to help prepare us for the things that are coming, help prepare us for the persecution that's coming, help prepare us for the hard times and the darkness that are coming. I know some of you say, well, brother, we're going to get raptured before any of that. 
Really? I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to go down that road right now. Hey, you know what? I always say, if the trumpet blows right now, praise God, I'm out of here. But as Keith Green said many, many years ago, pray for pre, prepare for post. It'll all pan out in the end. I added that. (laughs) Our focus needs to be on the Lord Jesus Christ, my friends, come what may. But let me get back to this this story, because I digressed. A community of Syrians who converted to Christianity from Islam is growing in Kobani, Syria. They were Islam. They were Muslims. It was a town besieged by Islamic State for months. Actually, I think it was years, honestly. And where the tide turned against the militants four years ago. After the war with the Islamic State, people were looking for the right path and distancing themselves from Islam, said Omar Faras, the founder of Kobani's Evangelical Church. There's an evangelical church birthed out of the ashes of ISIS in Kobani. This, this is called winning. This, this is like the addendum to my broadcast from last week. Omar Faras said the people were scared and felt lost. These were Muslims. Farak, Faras works for a Christian Christian aid group at a nearby camp for displaced people that helped set up this church in Kobani, ex-Muslims, because they saw what ISIS was doing. They saw what they what what they saw was their religion played out in front of them that they never realized. I have missionary friends who are who are in Iraq right now. Erdogan kicked them out of Turkey. They were working in Turkey for almost twenty years and they got deported last year. And I, I have so much, so much, I stand in awe of, of, of my friends. Because instead of coming home to the comforts of America after they got deported and kicked out of Tur- Turkey, they went over to Iraq. And they've been working among, among the Yazidi people and, and the Christians and those, the survivors, the survivors of, of, of ISIS. They've been ministering to these people and ministering the gospel to them and building relationship with them and, 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 and bringing them to Jesus. I, 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 I have them on Facebook. It's a private. They keep it private for only their friends because of the security issues. Sometimes I wish I could share the pictures that they share. Sometimes I wish I could share some things publicly that they share with me. But, it's, but I stand in awe of them because where they are, they're not, there's still some, they're still some uh, isolated ISIS enclaves not far from where they're ministering to these people. I've heard some saying here in America that a great awakening is coming. I've heard that a great day's harvest is coming. Do I think do I think there's going to be a great last day's harvest? Well, maybe. But I'll tell you this. If it does come, my friends, it's going to come through blood, sweat, and tears. It's not going to come the way much of the American faux prosperity church thinks it's going to come. No, my friend. It's coming on the wings of calamity, not prosperity. It's the way God's always done it. I don't think there's been a revival in the entire history of Israel or the church that came on the wings of prosperity. Prosperity. Could somebody please show me one revival in the Bible that came out that way? I do believe a harvest is coming, but it's not coming on the wings of prosperity and popularity. It's coming on the wings of calamity and persecution. But fear not, because here's the thing. Here's the good news. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And as I shared last week, once more time before I close out, in my broadcast, Winners and Losers, it may appear for a time that it looks like we're losing. Islam may gain ascendancy for a brief period of time. The Antichrist may wage war on the saints for a brief period of time and even overcome them for a season. The scriptures forewarn us of these things. The scriptures tell us of these things. It may look like the church is losing for a brief moment in time, my friends, but I want to tell you something. In the end, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Though the darkness is coming, yet the path of the righteous will grow brighter and brighter even until the coming of that perfect day. It may be an hour of darkness, but it's going to be an eternity of glory. Hallelujah. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is going to come in the morning. For the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in His wings, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to His temple, and the gates of hell shall not prevail 
I got to run, folks. My time is out. Please share this around Facebook. And thanks for tuning in to another edition of Open Up the Door. And keep it right here on Faith FM. Because there's still plenty of great Christian programming coming up. God bless everybody. I got to run.